In a fast-paced tech environment, the potential attack surface increases with each release and new app created. Detectify automates cutting-edge knowledge from trusted ethical hackers into the development pipeline for reliable application security. Go beyond the OWASP Top 10. Check your web apps for over 2,000 known vulnerabilities actively exploited in the wild, monitor subdomains for potential takeovers, and remediate security issues in staging and production. Learn more with a free trial at securityweekly.com forward slash detectify. Go hack yourself. By connecting to your code repository, Actrix generates a topology across your full stack to reveal risks so that you can harden your architecture. It also scans code for violations against compliance and security standards to enforce best practices. In addition, Actrix develops threat models using vulnerability feeds, IAM privileges, and other data to predict potential breach paths. Learn how easy it is to get started with Accurix at securityweekly.com forward slash Accurix. Application security is hard when security is separated from your DevOps workflow. Security has traditionally been the final hurdle in the development lifecycle. Iterative development workflows can make security a release bottleneck. With GitLab, security is built into the CI-CD process. Every code commit is automatically scanned for security vulnerabilities in your code and its dependencies. Results are delivered to the developer in their native workflow for rapid remediation. Learn how GitLab enables DevSecOps. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash GitLab for a 30-day free trial. Welcome back to Application Security Weekly. I'm your host, Mike Shima, joined by Matt Alderman and John Kinsella. Would you like to have all of your favorite Security Weekly content at your fingertips? Do you want to hear from Sam and Andrea when we have upcoming webcasts and technical trainings? Have a question for one of our illustrious hosts, someone from the Security Weekly team, or wish you could hang with the Security Weekly crew and community? Subscribe on your favorite podcast catcher, sign up for our mailing list, and join our Discord server to stay in the loop on all things Security Weekly, as well as chat with us when we do these live streams. Visit securityweekly.com slash subscribe. It's official. Security Weekly, in partnership with Cyber Risk Alliance, is excited to present Security Weekly Unlocked on December 10th, 2020. The inaugural edition of Security Weekly Unlocked also celebrates Security Weekly's 15th anniversary. Registration and call for speakers is now open. Deadline for CSP, though, is October 15th, so just a few days from now. So get your submissions in. Visit securityweekly.com slash unlocked to submit your speaking session and register for free. And now we dive into the news. And yes, we do have in a uh, going to have to um, get our George Takei voice in here and say we go from an IOT to an IO oh my on this particular uh, first topic. John, you flagged this. Do you want to uh, start us off here? <laughs> uh, yeah, I have to expect this one to make it through. So, um yeah, I'll start off talking here about, uh, you know, Redips had mentioned angle grinder and emergency room are cool. You know, that's we, we don't get to see that very often in our, our, our security, especially the application security world, uh, except when that write-up also mentions sex toys. So uh, it, it, this was fairly popular last week. There's a, um, a toy out there. And, you know, to preface all this, we're not here to kick shame or, or talk about that aspect of things. It's a little bit of funny haha, but still it's it's a practical real world thing. Um but there's a toy out there that that uh, it's Bluetooth LE as well as it's internet connected, so that you know you and your partner could uh, um, you know uh, have some have locking fun. I will say, uh, and people can go and find out the details if they want to. But it turns out, as with most of these IoT type things, there's pretty much absolutely no security being thought about in it. Um, so. Well, it's like I said, it's something that's getting a lot of attention. I think we can bring that back into our AppSec world and think about um, how do we actually use this to have conversations? It'll maybe a little bit more difficult to have conversations with this particular thing in the workplace, but still it's something, you know, a chance to take something that's public and getting a lot of attention and a lot of funny haha. ha and, and how do you actually, you know, go, hey, is maybe we have this in our product or is there something we're using that might have something similar? And, um, you know, I didn't actually mention the vulnerability beside the, the, the locking part of it and requiring the trip to the emergency room. There's a lot of data being that's easily accessible on the internet um, that has, you know, basically being able to iterate through and, and see other users or other customers use of these, these toys. Um, so yeah, sex sell, sex security, maybe not so much. Um, I don't know, you guys had any thoughts on this? No, I, I think you navigate authentication. 
<laughs> no, I, I think you navigated that quite well, John, because, yeah, I, I agree. There's th this might be one of those things that could be tougher to to have as a uh, discussion in certain environments. But, you know, all the giggling aside, there, there are two things that stood out to me. One, there was quite a journey here in trying to get the vulnerability disclosure process to be successful. In other words, researchers reaching out to what ostensibly was a small team of engineers, um, initially also apparently confused between PGP and GPG, um, if I'm remembering some of the details correctly, which is not a great um, you know, uh, uh, confidence builder in terms of just talking with engineers about basic security uh, topics. And the other aspect too about privacy. A lot of IoT devices um, can, are in our speakers. They're in these types of very personal toys that are collecting, uh, that they either have personal data or just the possession of them may be potentially embarrassing or are just very personal. So it, it, I think it does unlock a lot of these things if we start to say we're going to have 5G everywhere. So every IoT device can have its IPv6 um, uh, address and everything is this broad baseband communication. Just what are the devices talking? What are the devices leaking? And are we looking at them and securing them equally throughout the spectrum? So that, that was one of some of the reasons I, I did think it was worth bringing this in just to point out that we're not just talking about speakers or, or things like that when we talk about IoT and smart fridges, whatever that might be. Yeah, this will literally leave you in a pinch. <laughs> there we go. Then, speaking of vulnerability disclosure, that does lead us into Facebook. Was uh, recently this week talked about trying to sweeten the pot or add incentives for people to join and maintain a, a loyalty program, if you will, and a bounty program. And I thought this wasn't quite so interesting, perhaps specifically to Facebook, but it does make me wonder more generally about companies organizing bounty programs. At what point do you get? To, or when, when do you get to the point where participation starts to trail off or you're starting to just deal with a lot of very simple, ah, well, if the planet's aligned and this happened and a user clicked through three security warnings, then they could launch this self-reflected cross-site scripting versus here's a pretty consequential lock-in type of vulnerability that we were just talking about. So I think that's one of the reasons that stood out to me is that companies, companies are still exploring how to make bounty programs work for them over the long term. I'm glad you got this one here. I only saw it this morning, so I, I didn't see it soon enough to put it into the, the, the feed. I, I try not to bombard us with stuff the morning of. Um, interesting idea, the ability to say, um, you know, it's it's basically sort of a, a bounty program. It reminds it's sort of gamification of of the the overall um, process. Uh, I hadn't thought about it from that particular aspect of as people get bored. I don't know. Do do bounty hunters get bored? I, I mean, I guess at some point you go and look into another tool if you're if you're not getting return on investment, so to speak. Um, I, the the loyalty aspect of this made me cringe a little bit. Uh, from a point of view, and, and again, that's probably a loaded word, but from the point of view of is is this making the um, the playing field unlevel to folks that are entering that bounty space? What, it, what I th the, the first thought I had here is this is a frequent hacker program, right? That's basically what you're building here. <laughs> and it's interesting when you think about it from a the more you hack, the more uh, bounties you get, you move up in these different levels, there's five levels. But the interesting part is they pay you a bonus based on your level, which is interesting because think about this from a monetization perspective for a second. If I'm a hacker and there's a bunch of bugs that I that I get in the in either the bug bounties prices aren't going up or people aren't get you know, you can't find the bugs or whatever, you know, there's a there's a monetary incentive here. It says, oh, maybe I'll go work on something else. But if you keep the bounties at a good level and you're offering some bonuses because you've been this frequent hacker in the program, I mean, there might be some monetization benefits here in this kind of program, which is what I thought was interesting in the article. Yeah, I, I do like at least that they are going for money because that's one of the, the tough things about 
bug bounties is that you can spend a lot of time, but if that report that you submit comes back as a duplicate, so it's because someone beat you to the punch, that was a lot of your time spent for no reward. So rather than sending out t-shirts, um, you can get a bonus from, I think it was anywhere from 5% to 20%, depending on the level of, of your um, relationship within the league, as they're calling it, which was kind of funny, um, but also apparently get an Oculus 2 out of it. And that also kind of raised my interest, both in the sense of there's a barrier to entry for a lot of the hardware-based kind of bug bounties that not everybody wants to shell out the money for or an Oculus headset to maybe or maybe not find a vulnerability in it. So it's kind of a good way to use this is to, to, to identify who are the researchers that find good quality reports, who are the researchers that talk with us quite a bit and are probably then going to be spending some time looking at some of the hardware we'll send them with, with an Oculus, things like that. So it seems like a, it seems like a good investment because as we're talking about the last couple of weeks, how do you spend $50,000? You could spend it on the, the, the bounties you pay out for Chrome. We talked about a couple of weeks ago. You could pay, spend, pay it out for GCP compute resources to run some fuzzing, or in this case, put that into some bonuses for your loyalty program for your bug bounty uh, researchers. There's also, um, speaking still on the top of bug bounty, there was a great write-up so uh, for about uh, a total of 55 vulnerabilities that uh, five researchers found. And they, they haven't written up all of them because not all of them have been paid out yet, but really well-written um, article uh, about each of them. I also have to begrudgingly acknowledge that they had identified a cross-site scripting vulnerability in there that seemed actually pretty legit. Um, so kudos for that. But real quick, uh, it was uh, five researchers over roughly three months. And so far out of 32 payments, they've gotten um, almost $300,000. So this is roughly $20,000 per person per month of time spent. So that in that case for them, they didn't necessarily need a loyalty program with Apple. They just needed some good basic application security tooling, application security skills, and rip apart a lot of um, uh, good flaws. Yeah, so this average about nine thousand a bounty for people mm -hmm. tracking at home, which is a pretty decent payout. Um, you, you, when you think about some of the bounties, w what was interesting is it, there's so much detail in here, people. But the the first one that just I I probably couldn't look this up, but uh, Apple owns the entire seventeen point zero point zero point zero class A network, <laughs> and so they went out. And the first thing they did is they started scanning the entire public IP address range for Apple to, to find all the stuff that was on it. And they use that as a way to start all this different uh, bug bounty program. I mean, that's a pretty big address space to go out and, and have to uh, scan and identify all the assets on it. But that's where they started. Start with the basics, asset inventory. So, I mean, if you as an enterprise and organization don't can't you know can't find all of your devices, somebody's going to find them for you. That's a fantastic point. Yes. Um, and so. I don't, so again, I'll just re repeat, go, go read through the, the that write-up. It's a great way to learn about also just kind of the, the thought model of the approach of um, we have a company, Apple, what do we do? And start pulling apart um, a, a lot of the, the applications and figuring out the steps through the how to get a vulnerability to actually work. And that was one of the things about the, um, what they call the, the wormable stored cross-site scripting, playing with a style tag and trying to figure out how to get a script tag through what looked like either uh, regex part regex uh, pattern matches or weak parsers and getting and, and getting to an exploit, which also was um, tied nicely with another a, a little bit older um, article from uh, portswigger.net that was posted about uh, what was called a redefining impossible cross-site scripting without arbitrary JavaScript, and this. Again, um, it, it was a little bit, I, I won't say, I was about to say contrived, but this is a little bit more of a um, uh, non-standard scenario in the sense that it was a CTF, but it was saying you have a limited number of characters, go forth and conquer. And there was a lot of ingenuity here that the, the researcher, again, great write-up to read through how they've manipulated the JavaScript string object and then got into a lot of combining side channel and timing and leveraging Oracle. So there's actually, rather than just talking about cross-site scripting, expanded into some 
corners of JavaScript, which is always smart to do, as well as some other interesting security topics. So I definitely wanted to um, highlight that. And I think this also caught your eye, John. So I'm not sure if there's something you want to add there. Yeah, there was a bunch of good stuff around it. Um, so, you know, Port Swig are amazing as always. They have um, a, a, a lab uh, looking for, um, or sort of giving people this chance it's creating the the uh, the contriving the, the word just came from I guess to, to use mm -hmm. uh, a phrase of unexploitable cross site scripting. Um, this is it's it's not a long read the what we've posted itself, but it's really fun to see how do you you know if it's I think this is what really lights up a lot of us when we think about um, uh, penetration testing or hacking in any of these forms is like you've you've got a puzzle how do you solve this and like in this particular case you've been given a fairly uh, um, tight box. Cross-site scripting, frequently you've got a, a fairly small little window to work in to try and get your payload through. Um, and this one, they've made it even tighter still. So I think it, it's a fun read. Um, but also what I was just browsing, I hadn't looked at before because like, I think cross-site scripting, and I think the old rsnake cheats sheet, um, mm -hmm. and uh, the one that Portswigger has is actually pretty cool. So they've broken down um, to the event handlers what browsers they work in, code samples. It's actually a pretty neat cheat sheet. If I was doing a, a pen test in the morning, I might have to go back and, and take a read through this. Yeah, so it's a great way. And for me, what, what stands out here is just a lot of the cleverness of understanding your language environment, um, seeing that the, the windows stop uh, method, as well as getting into the string prototypes. And for me, it also, the, the way I would sort of turn this into a conversation with a development team is, is the, that uh, pointed question of why would you try and then start denying, have deny lists around pro particular cross-site scripting payloads and instead just dive in because there's a lot of parsing that can happen. There's a lot of JavaScript nuances that can happen within the, pro the, the prototype based language. There's a lot of weird methods you might not even be aware of. So it's definitely going to have to take a rethink in what your security model is or how you're going to approach that. Um, and that or also, leads us to go ahead. Also, I think it's it's a good example to to use. You know, as you like to usually say, use the frameworks. You know, don't try and create. I think when the the course examples in here, it shows you if you want to try and whitelist the stuff yourself, super difficult. You know, it's because there's always someone looking to build a better mousetrap. So use a framework that's out there that that's hopefully been coded to to you know protect against this type of stuff. Yeah. Indeed. I, and what, I, I just I like the thought process here, right, of how he mm -hmm. thought about this attack. I mean, if you really want to get into the mind of hackers and, and really kind of understand how they think through a problem and the different things they try and then, well, that didn't work. Let me go try this. It's just a great he just lays out kind of his whole thought process. I thought it was interesting to see, you know, where he got stopped, what he tried other research he did and said, well, let me try this, right? And boom, there you go, right? It's just it, just a, a interesting way to kind of be in the mind of a hacker. Absolutely. So, yeah, it's a great way to see that sort of threat modeling discussion and start saying, well, here's some assumptions. If I, if I only have quotes in uppercase A through uh, upper and lowercase A through Z and zero through nine, I don't have any angle brackets. I'm not going to be able to do anything with my intrinsic events and so on. So great way to highlight Different, different ways of thinking. We also had some um, different ways of thinking in uh, some other vulnerabilities that, again, nice write-ups. So we're always on the lookout for good write-ups that are educational. In this case, it was a um, RCE into a Fortinet's in, into a SIM. So one of my first re reactions here was just sort of that reminder that for as much as we call them the security team, that so the SEC and DevSecOps, if you will, any tooling we're adding, anything that we're adding is technically increasing the attack surface of our organization. So as we do increase that attack surface, we need to make sure that we're not also introducing flaws. And we saw this uh, just in the previous uh, article about VPNs that were discovered on Apple, as well as plenty of VPN vulnerabilities that we've, we've seen over this past year, um, as well as this case, uh, this particular SIM. Yeah, you yeah. Know, it's it, interesting. It's I, I, it, this one. I'm like, oh, that's the old Excel Ops product because that's how my mind thinks. I'm like, how did Fortinet get a sim? Oh yeah, they bought Excel yeah. Ops. But anyways, <laughs> uh, it's funny. I was I had that same thought. I hadn't tracked down where it came from yet. But um, 
Yeah. Uh, and, you know, security tools, and I know a sim's a tough one, right? Because you have all these inputs and outputs, and that's really its job is is to sort of act as the blender to make these things um, give you a nice, tasty beverage, uh, to <laughs> try to use that analogy. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure that worked. But um, I, I really don't like my security tools to have vulnerabilities. Um, and, and this wasn't directly in them, right? It was in a library they're using here i go i was talking about libraries being good here's a bad library um and it's not the last one we're going to talk about today but nope it, <laughs> yeah the next one is <laughs> kind of fun too <laughs> yeah yeah i you, you set it up john take it away yeah oh, can i just can i just read uh -oh. this one line please using an old installation framework equals dll hijacking enough said yeah. Yep. We're done. Turn um, off the podcast. So, <laughs> so, so what we're talking about, uh, our friends over at CyberArk uh, went through, did a little uh, testing on on some of the the good old antivirus products, whether you like those or just like those or whatever your opinion on them is. And I believe in seven of them, right? They found um, some pretty gnarly vulnerabilities. Uh, so. You know, and this 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 is such a tough one. It's this is we talked about the cat and mouse, or I was talking about the cat and mouse of of the 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 hacker, the bad guy, always trying to you know getting something up on on the good guy. And and it's always been the case with AV of all things, right? You know, back to the some of the earliest days of of back in Norton stuff like that. That who can who can actually get around who? And and these guys have a um, a very spirited job environment. I have no doubts just to keep up with this. But um, th this is an interesting you know look over several of these at once. And as Matt said, you know, that the DLL can sort of bite you. So um, we'll leave the AV part out of it and, and focus on, hey, as a uh, a product or as a security product or any product, how do you try and minimize um, your exposure and, and, and actually provide a, a solid application for others to use? Yeah, I think what stood out to me here is that the, the DLL hijacking, the privilege escalation during the install from the installers or the install process or um, uh, accessing logs and playing around with the, the time of check, time of use sort of, of race mm -hmm. conditions or, or mismatches, those, those aren't by any means unique to an AV, anything you're going to install. Yeah. And in fact, and we saw this way back, my, my sense of time is gone, but early on Zoom, when that first landed in the news, at least for us was largely due to an installer and an uninstaller process. So this is a problem that is pretty pervasive and not unique to Windows-based. It's it's on Mac OS, it's on Linux for that matter. Pretty interesting because when I first read this headline, I thought this was going to go into the file parsing and the where the analysis of the uh, of what an AV system needs to do. Um, but we'll set that aside for a second and just focus on what you were pointing out is that maybe we're also still dealing dealing with an unsolved problem of just what, what's a good installer? What's a good installer pattern? And I'll throw out again too, this is also a little bit predicated on your attacker or your, your um, adversary is executing something on your system. So how many of your systems are just patched, period? Because if it's not patched, pretty much anything that's a, a, a Linux kernel is going to have a local privilege escalation. A Windows system, and probably a Mac OS system for that matter, is going to have a local privilege escalation if you're just not on the latest uh, point release. Yep. Yep. Uh, yeah, so yeah, the, 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 the silence there was Matt and uh, John going back and checking their updates on um, on their, their laptop. So that, no, that, that's I a good thing. No, I checked mine before the show to make sure it didn't need to be rebooted. <laughs> Absolutely. I don't but, use um, it. So then, well, and so not necessarily talking too much about the AV specific, well, yes, going out to the AV specifics, where I thought it was going to be is these are systems that run, um, that tend to have to run with elevated privileges because they need to be looking at sensitive files and watching files that users are using. And where AV as well as browsers, so I'm going to set up our, our next point of discussion, get into problems are, you're dealing with file formats like images. 
um, compressed files, uh, files that have a lot of uh, PD that have notorious uh, flaws against their parsers, like PDFs. Um, and once you're trying to parse a PDF or parse file images or uncompressed data within an AV system or just within your mobile app or some other server side system, that's where I thought this was going. But those are the notorious areas for a lot of problems. And that's where that where you're doing that with the elevated privilege or put into a sandbox area, I think makes a lot more, uh, a, a lot bigger impact to your security model. And that is also then speaking of Chrome. So Chrome, um, I, I don't, we, we talked about vulnerabilities um, from almost start to almost finish. I also wanted to just throw this particular article here about Chrome's um, cache handling and what they've done differently, just to give us that, that perspective that security isn't just about finding the flaws and fixing them. Security can also come from improving architectures. And in this case, Chrome is changing its cache partitioning um, more so to prevent kind of a like privacy and information leaks that can come out of, of the browser. So I thought it was pretty interesting that um, they've been experimenting with this. And now um, just this month, the latest release, uh, Chrome 86, um, has this new cache partitioning system that basically puts into different buckets the way that a site is handling the, or the way that the data is handled for a top level site domain the URL that the that specific URL that the user has visited, and also they're adding the current frame that the user is interacting with. And those three combinations are pretty good in terms of killing off what have been some cross-site search or some cross boundary cross frame type of information attacks or oracles if we're talking back to that uh, cross-site scripting from Port Swigger. So let's just hope this isn't stored in a directory and they have a directory traversal error to no, be able that. to reconstruct it. So I'm waiting for that vulnerability just for you, Mike. It's funny you say that because there were there were some other things that this release did turn on. Um, they also enabled the the native file system API. Now it's it's, it's intended as a developer tool um, that basically gives web apps the, the ability to interact with files on the local device. And as they describe it, it's intended to build interactive apps like IDEs or photo and video editors. Basically, they're saying we're turning Chrome into yet another Electron app. Um, which Electron, you know, has V8 on the inside anyway. But this is where it's going to get interesting because not only where we, fingers crossed, are going to find some directory traversal bugs, um, but it's opening up, it's, it's kind of killing that barrier of what is your operating system and what is your browser and getting then no one needs root anymore. And do you really need a local privilege escalation from the installer capability of your AV device? Or as we were talking about with, with uh, Jim, do you just need to get somebody's token in internet? Interact and impersonate them within that web application or have a really good universal cross-site scripting that can exfiltrate data out of that browser or potentially, um, as it minutes along, out of the, the local file system. So that will be some interesting things to, to watch from, from my perspective. Yeah, always go for the lowest hanging fruit, right? I mean, it, if, if you're either a bad guy or a pen tester, you're, you're not going to immediately go and try to find the, the, the right bits of twiddle. You're going to look for, hey, is there something low-hanging that we can easily get to and, 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 and take advantage of? Um, I, I think what's interesting about some of these is is if, if you don't go to the effort to try and find the more advanced stuff, I mean, sometimes you'll, you'll um, I'll say stumble, I think that's accurate, you'll stumble over some of the basic ones along the way. Uh, this this one's interesting, you know. It's, we always like to see if we can persist an attack. That's that's hugely helpful. Um, someone can, you know, someone on Discord made a joke about turning it off and back on again. Um, mm -hmm. Same thing could be the computer, the browser, what have you. It's 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 if you're able to persist in there, that that's super handy. So I like the theory of what they're doing here. Um, be interesting to see how it plays out in the real world. It will be. And I think, um, and hopefully, uh, just a, a, as the other callback, I'll still keep my hopes up that uh, more of the modern browsers, as they're bringing in these types of capabilities, are also just pushing that WebAuthn standard so we can have better authentication ecosystem throughout the, the, the browser and the, the application 
um, um, handshaking because we can do that also it's going to be more resistant to phishing and impersonation because now no one needs to care in this case we're talking about cash partitioning the resource url that someone's visiting nobody needs to care about what that particular url is or need to manually inspect it to say is this really so in securityweekly.com or is there some fancy homograph attack or is there then something else that's that's doing some manipulation to to fool the the human end user so fingers crossed that, that there'd be something positive that comes out of all these things and i think unless so we can actually end on a positive note here or at least an optimistic one unless uh matt or john there's anything you wanted to 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 note about the upcoming week or reminders about that uh, the cfp for the security weekly unlocked so call for papers 37 submitted for i think about 12 to 15 slots so we've got great uh speaker sessions coming in we'll keep it open till the end of the week uh we've got we're going to finalize those on friday this week set the agenda for unlock so a uh, lot of great submissions already. Still a few days left to get them in, and then we're going to lock this agenda and go. There it is. We're going to lock down for the unlock, so get those CFPs in by the end of the week. Um, so, Matt, thanks again. John, thank you as well. Thanks to everybody in the Discord who's been hanging out with us during this, as well as thanks, uh, Jim, for uh, the, hanging out with us and talking about digital identity in the, in the last segment. So I'm going to say thanks once more. Uh, we'll return next week on Application Spookurity Weekly.